we will first consider the pastor and author Rick Warren. He is the founder and senior pastor of Saddleback Church, an evangelical megachurch located in Lake Forest, California, currently the sixth largest church in the United States. Warren has been invited to speak at national and international forums, including the United Nations, the World Economic Forum in Davos, the African Union, the Council on Foreign Relations, Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, TED, and Times Global Health Summit. He was named one of America's top 25 leaders by U.S. News and World Report. Warren was named by Time Magazine as one of 15 world leaders who mattered most in 2004. He is the builder of the Purpose Driven Network, a global alliance of pastors from 162 countries and hundreds of denominations who have been trained to be purpose driven churches founder of Pastors.com, a bi-weekly newsletter that is sent to more than 100,000 pastors and ministry leaders, an author of The Purpose Driven Life. According to a Barna survey, the book has also been most identified by American pastors and ministers as the most influential book on their lives and ministries. When I wrote the book, The Purpose Driven Life, and you asked about selfishness, the opening sentence of The Purpose Driven Life is four words. It's not about you. That is the most counterculture statement you can make. And it became the best-selling book in English in world history. It's next to the Bible. It's the best-selling book, and it's the most translated. <laughs> it's the most translated book next to the Bible, over 100 languages. As a philanthropist, Rick Warren is measurably improving people's lives around the world through his peace plan and other humanitarian works. It will change the world. He claims to be ushering in a new reformation in the church. But what is this new reform all about? Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, and his Saddleback Church have profound global influence. Saddleback has recently launched campuses in 12 strategic gateway cities around the world for their proximity to the final 3,800 people groups that still do not have a church. These global campuses, while headed by pastors already linked to local culture, will feature live worship and video or satellite feed messages from Warren. Because of this global influence, his ministry deserves serious scrutiny especially when he receives so much criticism for preaching a watered-down and superficial version of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In his Purpose Driven Life book, I just simply compared what Rick Warren was teaching against the scripture, line by line, precept by precept. My major concern with that book is that it is the way it omits the gospel. He has an agenda to teach, and uh, often if it, that agenda can't actually be found in the Bible, he'll he'll go to a paraphrase such as the message and he'll find uh, something in the message or another paraphrase that says something similar to what he wants to teach. I mean obviously as you read the book he uses dozens of different Bible translations and he'll skip from version to version based on what sort of spin he wants to put on the text. He chooses what fits his program and as a result you don't get convicted uh, when you're listening to Rick Warren. In his book, The Purpose Driven Life, on page 58, Warren essentially describes the gospel message as believe and receive. He writes, Right now God is inviting you to live for His glory by fulfilling the purposes He made for you. Real life begins by committing yourself completely to Jesus Christ. If you are not sure you have done this, all you have to do is believe and receive. Wherever you are reading this, I invite you to bow your head and quietly whisper the prayer that will change your eternity. Jesus, I believe in you and receive you. Go ahead. If you sincerely meant that prayer, congratulations. Welcome to the family of God. Notice in Rick Warren's version of the gospel presented in The Purpose Driven Life, there is no mention of repentance from sin. Without repentance, there is no forgiveness. The gospel message presented in the Bible clearly requires repentance from sin and faith in Christ as inseparable for a person's salvation. While Warren defines repentance as a mental shift and to change your mind, repentance is most importantly turning from sin itself and turning to God. Jesus did not come to save people in their sins, 
but to save them from their sins. He did not come in order that you might continue in sin and escape the penalty, but so that you would be saved from the sins themselves. Rick Warren is very dangerous, and here's the reason why. The guy is actually a genius, but he's using his genius in a way that harms churches. We went to meet Rick Warren in person because he wanted to meet his critics and find out why in the world we're against him. So I think the idea was, well, let's bring some of our critics out here, and once they meet me, they'll decide I'm okay. But what I did was I pleaded with him to start preaching the gospel. And I said, let me explain what I mean by the gospel. Then I preached the gospel to him, uh, the person of Christ, the person of work of Jesus Christ. And of course it fell on deaf ears. Rick Warren spoke at TED. I mean, he, here he is with an audience of uh, very influential people with an opportunity to say anything he wanted to say. And uh, that would be the opportunity really to give the gospel, and he didn't do it. He gave them a message of works, really. He said, God likes it when you be you, you know, you're wired to do a certain thing and you need to find out, look at your shape and do it. In the book, I talk about how you're wired to do certain things. You're shaped with a little acrostic, spiritual gifts, heart, ability, personality, and experiences. These things shape you. And if you wanna know what you ought to be doing with your life, you need to look at your shape. What am I wired to do? Why would God wire you to do something and then have you do it? If you're wired to be an anthropologist, you'd be an anthropologist. If you're wired to be an underseas explorer, you'd be an underseas explorer. If you're wired to make deals, you make deals. If you're wired to paint, you paint. Did you know that God smiles when you be you? And when you write a book that the first sentence of the book is, it's not about you, <laughs> then when all of a sudden it becomes the best-selling book in history, you got to figure, well, I guess it's not about me. That's kind of a no-brainer. So what is it for? Yeah, he starts his book out, of course. It's not about you. But if that sentence weren't there and you read the book, you'd think it is about you. you know. And when he gave that talk to the, the TED audience, uh, it was about him. It was all about him and what he and his wife did with his money. So um, we, we gave it all back to the back. And then we set up three foundations uh, working on some of the major problems of the world, illiteracy, poverty, um, pandemic diseases, particularly HIV AIDS, and set up these three foundations and, uh, and put the money into that. The last thing we did is we became what I call reverse tithers. Practically everything he said came across as a boast. You know, you listen to that lecture and he had about 20 minutes there to say anything he wanted and I would guess probably 18 and a half of the 20 minutes were all about him. He really didn't mention Christ a single time in that TED lecture. He, he mentioned the name of Jesus because he described an incident where a woman came and showed him a piece of paper and said she could see the face of Jesus in it, but he basically brushed her off and rolled his eyes and said, you know, what a kook. A lady came up to me the other day and she had a, a white piece of paper, Michael, you like this one, and she said, what do you see in it? And I looked in and I said, well, I don't see anything. And she goes, well, I see Jesus, and started crying and left. I'm going, okay, you know, fine. Uh, <laughs> good for you. He had nothing whatsoever to say about Jesus. Apparently, he doesn't even see Jesus in Scripture, because that's not what he talks about when he gets the opportunity. So the good life is not about looking good, feeling good, or having the goods. It's about being good and doing good. The bottom line is God gets pleasure watching you be you. Why? He made you. And when you do what you were made to do, he goes, that's my boy. That's my girl. You're using the talent and the ability that I gave you. So my advice to you is look at what's in your hand, your identity, your influence, your income, and say, it's not about me. It's about making the world a better place. Thank you. I look at that and I think this sort of epitomizes the, the whole seeker-sensitive approach. And, and, you know, not just to pick on Rick Warren, but he is the most visible and influential of the 
seeker-sensitive guys. And as I listen to him and watch him and these opportunities when he's on national TV or in a forum like TED or whatever, does he preach the gospel? And the answer is consistently, no, he doesn't. Uh, he didn't put it in his book. He doesn't preach it when he has the microphone. Uh, and and I, that troubles me. Uh, it shows that there's something seriously wrong with his perception of what the purpose of the church and his purpose as a minister really is. What it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ is to say, I give as much of myself as I understand mm -hmm. to as much of Jesus Christ as I understand at that moment. And yeah. then you keep growing in it. In his book, The Purpose Driven Life, and in his video series, 40 Days of Purpose, he does not give a clear gospel. As a matter of fact, the gospel that he does give is very weak and very watered down. And this is alarming to people, many of them who went through the series, who do not know Jesus Christ and don't know the true gospel. For example, in his, his video series, I want to read from this, The 40 Days of Purpose, Warren leads his listeners in a prayer. Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? If you're not sure of this, maybe you've gone to church all your life, maybe you've never been in church, it doesn't matter. I'd like the privilege of leading you in a prayer to settle this issue, that you are connected to Christ. So let's bow our heads together. I'm going to pray a prayer, and you can follow it silently in your mind. Let's pray. Now, it needs to be kept in mind that at this point, Warren has talked virtually nothing about the cross, about the crucifixion, about the fact that we're sinners, about our need for salvation, about what Jesus did for us. Virtually nothing that, that a person who has very little knowledge of the Bible should know before they commit their life to Jesus Christ. And so, at, but at the end of the first session in his video series, he asks the people to pray this prayer at the end of that series. He says, I want you to repeat after me. Dear God, I want to know your purpose for my life. Dear God, I want to know your purpose for my life. I don't want to waste the rest of my life on wrong things. Today I want to take the first step in preparing for eternity by getting to know you. Jesus Christ, I don't understand it all, but as, as much as I know how, I want to open up my life to you. I ask you to come into my life and make yourself real to me. And use this series in my life to help me know what you made me for. Thank you. Amen. Now, if you just prayed that prayer for the very first time, I want to congratulate you. You've just become a part of the family of God. That is deeply disturbing to me because, again, he, he mentions nothing here about our need for a Savior, the fact that we're sinners, the fact that we're under the wrath and judgment of God, the fact that Christ died in our place, the need for repentance, the need for faith. None of these things and many others were mentioned prior to this prayer. And yet the prayer is about finding your purpose in life. Lord, I, I want to find my purpose in life, and I want you to help me find my purpose in life. And if you'll help me find my purpose in life, then, then that's great. And then he says, after you prayed such a prayer, then congratulations, you're now become part of the family of God. Well, most likely, such people that would pray such a prayer have no concept of why Christ died for their sins, why they need a Savior, anything along that line. And therefore, they're praying a prayer to find purpose, they're not praying a, a prayer to find forgiveness from sin and to be made right with a holy God. And therefore, I, I think this series definitely underplays the gospel. It makes it very weak. It, it makes it very easy uh, to believe without even understanding our need for salvation. And therefore, it is very alarming and very concerning that people could take this video series, read the book, pray a little prayer, and think they're saved when in reality they don't know the first thing about why Jesus Christ died for them. I've seen Rick Warren in several venues where you, you desperately want someone who's going to preach the gospel. The TED Talk was one. He's been on Larry King and other network news programs where he's been questioned and interviewed about things like the meaning of life and what is, the, what is our purpose as a human race. Great doorways through which you could drive a truckload of gospel truth but he's I've never seen him actually take the bait I've never actually seen him make the most of those opportunities and preach the gospel the closest he came was when he told Alan Combs uh, to give Jesus a 30-day money-back trial 
But what about what does it say for all those people who do not accept Christ as their personal Savior? I'm saying that this is the perfect time to open their life to give it a chance. I'd say give them a 60-day trial. Even that notion that Jesus is someone you could you should give a try to, and if it, if he doesn't do what you think he should or work the way you want him to, then you can just abandon him. I suppose uh, that's that's the way pagans think. That's not the gospel. That's not something a gospel preacher should ever say. Is that yeah, a 60, 60 day trial? Does that sound like the book of the month? See if you'll change your life. I dare you to try right. trusting Jesus for 60 days. Right. Do you, your so, money guaranteed back. Uh, uh, but, uh, really? Are you going to give me the money back? <laughs> Absolutely. Rick Warren's flawed gospel is only a symptom of a greater sickness, the fruit of the church growth movement of which he is a part. This prevalent movement within evangelical Christianity can be identified by a philosophy of ministry intentionally designed to effect numerical growth. The seeker-sensitive label is often associated with these megachurches in the United States where Christian messages are often accompanied by elaborate spectacles and elements drawn from secular pop culture, such as rock music and other forms of entertainment. Their methodologies are often more attentive to market strategy, business techniques, and demographics rather than biblical instruction. The church growth movement was founded by two people independently, Donald McGavran and Robert Schuller. Both men influenced Rick Warren. Rick Warren has readily pointed out that Donald McGavran brilliantly challenged the conventional wisdom of his day about what made churches grow. McGavran's 1955 book, The Bridges of God, cited in Warren's The Purpose Driven Church, is said to have launched the church growth movement. McGavran later funded the Fuller School of World Missions and Institute of Church Growth, an organization further expanded by C. Peter Wagner. While Donald McGavran could be said to be the intellectual founder of the movement, Robert Schuller is its most notable popularizer. Robert Schuller followed in the footsteps of Norman Vincent Peale, pioneer of the theory of positive thinking and most notably known for his book The Power of Positive Thinking. In his book Positive Imaging, The Powerful Way to Change Your Life, Peale mixes humanistic psychology with Christianity. Author George Mayer writes, He is also the father of the self-help movement that formed the groundwork for the church growth movement. Peel formed perhaps the most dramatic and meaningful link between religion and psychology of any religious leader in history. It is this same approachable, therapeutic brand of religion that many megachurches, including Saddleback, put forward today. It is this kind of religion that is so appealing to the masses of unchurched men and women that Rick Warren hopes to reach. In the 1950s, Robert Schuller began to integrate the positive thinking philosophy of Norman Vincent Peale with business-oriented marketing strategies. Possibility thinking was Schuler's form of Peel's positive thinking. Schuler adapted church growth principles to his own theology of self-esteem, which lured Southern Californians into his church. In his own words, Schuler said, Then I proceeded to spend about fifty dollars for brochures, hoping to impress unchurched people I wrote to Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, who wrote back a marvelous statement with his permission to quote extensively, so I grabbed hold of his coattails. Eventually, Schuler built the glassy Crystal Cathedral and his multi-million dollar television ministry. Author George Mayer not only explains that Norman Vincent Peale laid the foundation of the megachurch movement, but he also notes that it was Robert Schuller who helped create the effectiveness of the church growth movement on a national scale. Schuller boasts that two of his most famous students were Saddleback Pastor Rick Warren and Willow Creek Community Church Pastor Bill Hybels. Schuller states, Think about it. In 1970, where could a pastor go to learn successful principles for personal, spiritual nourishment and church growth? There was not a single source except the sometimes cumbersome route through the denomination. Our institute has set a new and respected precedent. Alumni include Bill Hybels, Rick Warren, 
and many, many others who found the fundamental principles of success at our sessions, and the rest is church history. Mayer writes, In the 1990s, following in the footsteps of Peel and Schuler, the leader of the next generation of church growth movement pastors emerged. That man was none other than Rick Warren. Rick Warren has publicly distanced himself from Robert Schuler and Norman Vincent Peale when he spoke to WorldNet Daily. I've only met Robert Schuler twice, I believe. I've never had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him, not once. So how do I even know him? He disavows Robert Schuler. Because when, when I was out there in person talking with him, he said, oh, Schuler's a heretic, I don't want anything to do with Schuler. And then so we said, well, I heard that you went to Schuler's Church Girl Seminar, because, you know, that was written up in Christianity Today or somewhere. And he said, oh, I had won a contest at seminary, so that's where I had to go. I didn't really want to be there. But no matter how much Rick Warren and his apologists try to create a greater rift from Schuler, the influence is undeniable. Rick Warren's own wife, Kay Warren, confesses that Schuler had a great impact on her husband, Christianity Today reported, during his last year in seminary, he, Rick Warren, and Kay drove west to visit Robert Schuler's Institute for Church Growth. We had a very stony ride out to the conference, she says, because such non-traditional ministry scared her to death. Schuler, though, won them over. He had a profound influence on Rick, Kay says. We were captivated by his positive appeal to non-believers. I never looked back. So profound and life-changing was Warren's visit to Schuler's Institute. He imitated and adopted Schuler's positive appeal to non-believers. The article continues. Imitating Schuler, Warren walked the then unincorporated but fast-growing town of Lake Forest, asking what kept people from going to church. It is not so much that Rick Warren became a proponent of Schuler's self-esteem preaching or New Age spirituality, but he did, like Schuler and Peel, set out to build a church that would appeal to unbelievers. Rick Warren writes, Create a service that is intentionally designed for your members to bring their friends to, and make the service attractive, appealing, and relevant to the unchurched that your members are eager to share it with lost people they care about. Though Warren may not see eye to eye with Schuler's heretical doctrine, the seeker model church was adopted by Warren following in the steps of Peel and Schuler. As Warren recalls the early days of building his church, he talked about going door to door, not with the gospel, but with the following pitch. My name is Rick Warren. I'm not here to sell you anything. I'm not here to convert you. I'm not here to witness to you. I just want to ask you three or four questions. Question number one, are you an active member of a local church of any kind of religion, synagogue, mosque, whatever? If they said yes, I said great, God bless you, keep going, and I politely excused myself and went to the next home.